Hello everybody, it's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody's having a great start to your week so far. We're midway through for those of you who work a five-day work week. or We are progressing uh, significantly for those of you like me who work six-day work weeks, uh, sometimes seven. Uh, but I've definitely slowed down a lot. I'm here to talk to you about something that I'm extremely passionate about something that I've written about for years, something that I have consistently sounded the clarion about. Uh, anybody who's followed me over the years, um, shoot, nearly 15 years on social media, 30 years uh, in the regular world, um, and I have gone hard in the paint and the one thing that can be said about me is I stand hard and go hard for my brothers, but I have been a staunch and strong and consistent advocate for our women, our sisters. I have spoken hard. I have uh, been called everything from a simp to a sucker because I go hard for our women uh, and I fight hard for our women. I believe that that's the place of a man is to first and foremost protect. I believe that before a man is even capable of having the wherewithal and the skill set to be a provider, he already is physically gifted and prepared to be a protector, uh, to stand in defense of our women. And so when I see uh, things like intimate partner violence, intimate partner homicide. There are programs created to address that within the Odyssey Project because that matters to me. Uh, but one of the things that goes silently by, there's a lot of noise being made about intimate partner violence, domestic violence, intimate partner homicide, and uh, especially with the role of the black man in that, there's a lot of noise being made about that. But you want to know where there's hardly any noise and little to uh, little to any advocacy and almost dead silence, missing black women. I uh, wrote several articles, recent articles, on the topic uh, over the last week. And I have written probably a good 50 articles. I have spoken, I have lectured, I have uh, created advocacy programs, uh, and spoken in many cities on this issue and it is a complex issue um, and it's crazy you know there is this standing static number of 64,000 I can tell you there's far more than 64,000 black women missing there are 64,000 plus roughly around 75,000 that we can say that are on record as missing uh, a lot haven't been reported uh, for various reasons uh, and those reasons are no excuse for not caring about them. I, I, I don't discount people because of their place in this world. I see the homeless man the same, same way I see the CEO. They're just in different places. Uh, their life matters to me. Um, I actually believe the manner I, in which I handle those who are going through has more value than the way that I handle those who have the ability or opportunity to enrich me. So that's my stand on that. But when we talk about black women, I'm so frustrated because of the silence, not just the silence of the system, but the silence of my people, uh, the unwillingness to really stand up, the unwillingness to make noise. I put a link to two articles uh, that I've written on this recently. Uh, uh, and um, on two different two different sites, um, and I I hope that you, I put the links and I hope that you read them because you need to become aware of what's going on and why. This is a complex dynamic, but we need to be more involved. We uh, you often hear me say almost seems like almost every time I'm on that we are where we are because we don't understand how things work. We tend to just take things at face value. A lot of black women missing and even the people who are talking about it are talking about it from a superficial level. Very few people are taking time to really examine what's going on and why and then to ask what can we do about it? How can we make the lives of these young black women who are for all intents and purposes forgotten how can we make their lives matter uh, that means something to me that means something to me because as a black man women are going missing on my watch 
and no, I am uh, maybe not culturally or even socially held responsible, but to me, it shouldn't matter to me as a black man that our women are being victimized, that our women are being exploited, that our women are being harmed. It should, it, it should matter to every black man. I don't care where they're at. Uh, they may not be someone you want to marry. They may not be someone you want your son with, but they are still black women trying to find their way. There's uh, some black girls and black babies involved as well. And so to me, it matters. Uh, I, I, I am not one to discount someone's value in this world because of where they at. The homeless man, again, same status in me and for as I'm concerned as a CEO. And that may be a unique position. It may sound foolish, but as a man that's been in both places, my value never changed when I was at the bottom. When I, when I fell off my perch, my value didn't change. My position did. And it taught me so much about life and how to value people. And it taught me how to love on those people. And it taught me how to care about those people. And I've never forgotten that. And I've climbed back out of that valley. But I've never forgotten the walk in it. And I will never allow that to be uh, my mindset that I'm better than somebody because of where I'm at. Because I know how quickly that can change. And when it comes to our sisters, nobody ends up in the places that some of these young ladies are ending up because that was their desire. And so we have to ask ourselves the questions we don't like to ask, the questions of why, the questions of what happened, how did it happen? What can we do to not only make their lives matter, but to reduce the frequency at which this type of thing happens? We've got to be actively engaged. We've got to do more than just sit up and see things as anecdotal. We've got to do more than just sit around and pretend that everything is okay and we really truly have a place in this, in, in this God-forsaken place, this country, that we really don't have. We've got to stop pretending the Mercedes doesn't mean we matter. The, the Jordans don't mean we matter. The square footage doesn't mean we fit in. It's just something that we're fighting and scratching for to say we have a piece of the pie when we don't even have a seat at the table. And I've long ago given up the idea of even wanting to be at the table. I want my own damn table, but... I want to be able to serve people at this table that definitely won't be received anywhere close to their table. See, they'll invite me over to hang out at their table, but I don't control anything at it. I can be enriched and fed real well at it, but I don't control anything at it. The moment that I start trying to take things off of that table and bring them into the people that matter to me, they'll remove me from that table. So I don't want to be there. Because, see, my people matter to me. The young sisters that are struggling to make it, make ends meet matter to me. The sisters that are in the strip clubs matter to me. The sisters that are on the corner matter to me. That's somebody's daughter, somebody's granddaughter, somebody's sister, somebody's mom. But let's talk, you know, about what's going on. So why is it that we have so many black women missing? The first thing is when I looked and I, I looked for the latest research because, I, you know, I try to update my numbers, um, you know, from the last time I've done some substantial research in the area. And the thing that blew my mind uh, uh, was that in 2022, there was 268 well, almost 269, 268, 884 women that went missing. Out of that, 100,000 of those were black women. Now, you're saying, well, how is it if 100,000 went miss, missing in one year that we're only talking about 64,000 missing because some were recovered? Alive and not. They were found, but 100,000 went missing in one year. And so what are some of the reasons that this happens? Uh, number one is 
the system that is normally used to policing and protecting, well, protecting and serving polices our community. And many times the women who go missing have found their way in the system either as victims or as perpetrators. And because they have a record in the system, they are dismissed. Uh, they are given a lower priority than white women. This isn't something I'm saying uh, out of just, this isn't something I'm just pulling out of my head. This is statistical. There is a greater deal of police involvement when a white woman becomes uh, goes missing. Uh, there's a great uh, level, a great, uh, a much higher level of media exposure when a white woman goes missing. Think about what happened with the um, white girl who went on the road trip with her boyfriend and ended up missing and he ultimately ended up killing himself uh, in Florida but they went on this cross trip living out the back of the truck or whatever. I, don't, I can't remember her name but think about the media coverage that got. Think about the media coverage that got. I could talk about easily right now 20 black women that went missing. A couple in Houston, another, uh, some more in Houston that were murdered, that were notable. These were people that were notable in, in the influencer world. Or, you know, and nothing major happened. It, it was on social media for a while, but it faded. It definitely wasn't getting a uh, dateline. It wasn't getting 2020. It wasn't getting seen. It wasn't getting that type of exposure. That white girl that went missing, uh, and 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 here and, and please understand me. This isn't about my feelings or relationship towards white people. I'm not saying that the white girl shouldn't have got the attention. I'm saying that black women deserve the same attention. I'm saying that they deserve the same amount of exposure, and that what family they come from and background. One of the things that we need to stop doing as a people is qualifying our victims. We, you know, we have to justify why people should care about their lives. He was an A student, you know, she did, she ran track and she did this. She was a all on a roll AP, you know, student and, 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 and all of this. She was murdered. She is missing. She was abused. She was exploited. It doesn't matter what her background is. She didn't deserve to be done that way. And we've got to stop qualifying who is being wronged. If they were wronged, I don't care who they were. If they didn't deserve what happened to them, they deserve to have justice. And we have got to be at the forefront of demanding that with our dollars, with the way we move, and with our own energy and effort, we've got to give value to the things that should matter to us. But uh, some other things that I pulled up, not only are they that because of the system, but also uh, there is this tendency to hypersexualize black women more than any other thing. Don't get me wrong, we live in a culture where women are sexualized, period. But black women are hypersexualized. They're hypersexualized by the system. They're hypersexualized by the music industry. They're hypersexualized by Hollywood. And they're even hypersexualized by our own culture. And so what happens is when they go missing, it's just their behavior. They brought it on themselves. They were too promiscuous. They were fast. All of these things, not, I don't care how fast a baby is. She doesn't deserve to be approached, handled, mishandled, mistouched, or anything like that. How fast. It's amazing how we make up all these excuses not to hold one accountable for doing something absolutely atrocious. There's no such thing as she was fast, so she deserved to stop that. She ran away, so she doesn't deserve to be found. And she's under the age of 18. She ran away. She still deserves to be found. Are they out there looking for the little white girls and white boys that ran away? 
Shit, look, until until little Becky is found, ain't nobody resting. Shit's all over poles and fences, and it's on the news, and it's on poster boards, and it's on billboards. It's all over the freaking place. But our babies and our ladies silently drift into the obscurity of the past darkness, and we just keep moving. We've got to stop that. Think about how angry we are about a lot of stuff that's going on. Sandra Bland, Tiana Taylor, uh, Brianna, uh, God, there I go. Uh, so many. It, maybe it's Brianna Taylor. I'm, I'm, uh, and it's Tiana something, something else. But what I'm trying to get you to understand is there's so many of these things that we see that we get in it, it, irate about. And then we emotionally drain from the anger because you can't hold that anger for, for such a, uh, a certain amount of time. And then you have to let it go. And then when you let it go, you move on. Because there's no set rules or protocols or principles or ideas uh, and strategies of how we handle it when someone goes missing in our communities. We're supposed to be equipped and trained and uh, equipped and resourced to be able to go out and act on our own. We are too brilliant to be so helpless. Everything is we need you to do. We can y'all do. Let's ask them to do this. And we won't do anything for ourselves. Oh, we, we love a good debate. We love a good conversation. We love to talk about it, but the actual getting out and putting in the work, designing and strategizing and coming up with something, we don't want to do it. And then when he, even when someone does it, you know, we don't want to get behind it. Oh, God forbid, well, I want to do that. And it, what's sad is these women are going by what's in the uh, uh, uh we, we 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 don't understand the force and the power of um human trafficking sex trafficking uh the second most uh prevalent industry in the world behind arms dealing arms trafficking human trafficking drug trafficking yes there's more money in moving humans than there are in moving drugs. And they target the ones that people are least likely to put up the most fight over to find. The one that's going to come with the least amount of static. And so that should say something to you. Like when someone's saying, I don't want the smoke, so let's go take black girls and black young black women. It should get on. It, 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 I, I, I take that personally. You're in my backyard taking from me and you're doing it because you basically said, I'm not going to do anything about it. Now, we'll kill somebody for stepping on our kicks. But they end up taking our babies, our women. And we standing around doing nothing. And, and this isn't just about black men not doing nothing. This is the black community not having committed a uh, committed enough emphasis on creating something that answers and responds to the need of talking about and dealing with it not just running off rampant these articles these lectures mean absolutely nothing if it doesn't produce action we can't sit people reading that reading that unless they actually see somebody who's been kidnapped and say, I seen that person and call and that person gets rescued. Reading it does nothing. It has to inspire activity. It has to inspire a willingness to be involved. It has to inspire a passion that says something is going to have to change and it's going to start with me. That's what we need. The idea that we can we can talk and we can click and we can share our way to liberation, to safety, to peace, to power. It's absolutely absurd. We're gonna have to build. We're gonna have to sacrifice. We're gonna have to be willing to sit up and say, not on my watch. We don't wanna get involved with anything. 
until it lands on our doorstep. Then all of a sudden, we want people to come. And the crazy thing, I've actually had people that challenged me on uh, what I was trying to do and raising funds and, shit, and then turn around and guess who's in my inbox because somebody in their family was wrongfully arrested. Guess who's in my inbox because somebody got shot by the police guess who's in my and i mean like i've been going hard in the paint i've made enemies um i've had my life threatened i've had my family threatened which was big to me um and just just so we're clear and because i know that more than my people watch this i'm a real i've grown into so let me be clear because some of my old peeps will be to call me out I've grown into a very, very laid back person, but you can still get touched. I don't care what you say about me. I don't care. But when you make any type of idle or intentional gesture towards doing anything to my family, you will feel me. I want to make that extremely clear. You will feel me. I have absolutely no qualms about touching you. And the thing is, with that being said, I get the mindset of some. I don't agree with it, but I get it. You go out there and you go in the fight for people who you fight for, you save, and they're right back out there. Yeah, and it's so many different things. My thing is sometimes I, I just had this mindset my entire life that if I live my life and I change one life, one life is better because I was here. It was worth it. Now, I've done far more than that, and I will continue to do that. But that's the way I'm built. So I don't expect to save everyone, but I don't get to pick and choose who I save. Because the person I write off might be the next person to do X, Y, Z, might be the person who comes along and, and is the mentor to my granddaughter. I don't know. But what I do know is I'm looking at you and you're breathing, you're worth saving. Now, I know sometimes that ends up coming to bite you in the back, but we spend way too much time looking for reasons not to do anything than we do to do something. I'm not going to ever be that person. I didn't get where I am by looking for a reason to quit, looking for a reason to turn my uh, turn my back to something, looking for a reason not to show up. I, I'm not that way. You, when you when you look and you find these reasons not to be an advocate, not to be a voice, not to be a force, not to be a part of a system that operates and does and handles and engages stuff, you may avoid the smoke, but you build a horrible, pitiful and pathetic life that shows nothing of a sense of accomplishment. You may even accumulate a lot of things. You may be successful in the eyes of society. But your soul is asking you to do something deeper and better than accumulate things. You're not here to accumulate things. Nothing wrong with things. But you're not here to accumulate things. You're here to touch lives, to make an impact. And it ought to bother you that we're talking about this many black women going missing. Just the idea that they feel safe targeting my, 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 my sisters and my, 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 my little babies. No, you're not safe. And if I ever see you, it won't be no police involved. Or they'll, they'll probably be dealing with me. But you, you, you're you going to be okay. I have absolutely no tolerance for harming kids and women. Absolutely none. So when, it, when, when, when I catch you, I'll deal with the consequences. And we need more men that are willing to deal with the consequences. I'm not saying I'm no straight up whatever. But uh, the one thing I can say is I agree with Dr. King 100% that a man that does not have something for which he is willing to die is not fit to live. And there, are, you know, I've always had something for which I was willing to die. The good thing is. The things I'm which, for which I'm willing to die for now are not as stupid as the things I used to be willing to die for. 
the things now have far more value and lasting impression. If I die for those things now, I write a legacy. I'm okay with that. What I'm not okay with is sitting idly by and pretending I don't see something that I see far too often and expecting the system that's okay with it and co-signing it to fix it on my behalf so I don't have to do anything. Enough is enough. <laughs> said this before and I, I got in trouble with a couple of sisters but I, 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 I said it from a place of love and understanding the outcome of this thing I don't like to see our sisters in any position that they shouldn't be in solely because they figured out how to do it doesn't mean that they should be and it should bother men that they are and we should be doing things to change it. We should understand what the impact is. And um, I got chewed out about saying I, I, I can't stand to hear strong black women. It's not that I have anything against strong black women. I was reared by them. I was around them. I, I absolutely love them. My problem is every time I hear that, it's associated with a black woman doing something she's not supposed to be doing. Or she's doing something that she shouldn't be doing on her own. To me, that's a failure. And to just be okay, oh man, another grown. Why does she have to be? Now, it doesn't mean she's any less strong if she's in connection and covered by a man. She's still that same strong person. It's just now that strength is being fueled by the peace and the security of his covering. That's the relationship part. Moving on from that, because this is not what this is about. But I just, I don't like how comfortable we are with the suffrage, suffering of our women, the harm of our women, the harm of our children. I mean, that, that has to be something we're willing to fight for. There's got to be something. We, we, our children are being miseducated. Our men are being mass incarcerated. We are being gentrified uh, and on and on. And no, we don't do anything. Is it something we're willing to stand on? How about let's start with saying, keep your hands off our women. And yes, I know that there's a large portion of these women that are missing that are working girls. And I'll tell you again. I've spent my entire life understanding the dynamic, what flows and how things happen. They didn't end up there because they woke up as three and four year olds and said, I want to be a working girl when I grow up. So we got to ask ourselves, what are we missing? I'll tell you part of it. Broken homes. Identity crisis. That's and I can go on and on things we're missing because we're so goddamn consumed with our own selves that as long as I'm happy, I don't care what I screw up. Yes, they targeted the black family and they targeted the black home, but we made it easy for them. We didn't value it enough to stand up for it. To, to, to figure out what needed to be fixed in it and and why it was worthy of saving. So we let them destroy it and we, we, we let them gas us up on how cool it was to be independent and strong. And I'm not just talking about the women because they understood through their study of us, the study of our history, the study of history in general, the study of our people and how we operate and how we move and how we best function, sociological studies they understand that when they divide the man and the woman when they make the man unwilling to protect the woman when they make the man see the woman as the problem when they make the woman see that she can do and move in a lot of ways that she thought she needed a man to do without a man that all of a sudden she doesn't need a man the synergy that is created through the sinking of that masculine and feminine energy for the faces and the, the basis and the foundation of the black family is disrupted. 
And when you disrupt the basis of the black family, you disrupt the ability to inculcate fat values, interests, and principles into the psyche of young black children who grow up and then perpetuate those values and go out in society and create things and spaces and opportunities and businesses and, and so much more for themselves. And they accumulate what we lack now, which is power. But it starts with having a, 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 an environment in which they can be nurtured and they can be taught and they can have what they need impressed upon them at an early age so that it can be instilled and covered and protected. And we're sending them out there in the world that constantly tells them they're not good enough, that tells them they're not beautiful enough, that tells them they're not smart enough, that tells them they're naturally criminalistic, naturally animalistic, and that they don't deserve anything and that this is the best that they can do. And then we're wondering why they're so easily manipulated and exploited when they go out there and they try to do something and they realize it's a little hard. I wonder why they didn't just come back when they found it was hard and they thought the only thing that they could turn to was the street. We don't want to answer that question. That's an ugly question. I don't, I don't claim to be the best father in the world. I don't claim to have it all together. But one thing I can say is there's not one of my kids that can't come to me. Without judgment. I don't care what you did. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care how you identify sexually. I don't care. What I want you to know is when you need your pops, I got you. I'm not going to co-sign no bullshit. I'm not going to tell you that your shit don't stink. But I got you. You know. The thing is. I want them to be able when they get into that bind. You know, that bind they got into because they were grown and they didn't want to listen. That bind they got into because they figured they knew it all and they were going to go off and figure it out on their own. The bind that uh, they got into because they only thought for the next two weeks and didn't think about the next year. That bind, I want them to know that when you realize that, hey, this wasn't what I thought it was, come back and we'll figure it out. That's going to save a lot of our babies from ending up in situations like this. But if the, if the baby does end up in situations like this, they still deserve us to come looking for them. They still deserve for us to make noise about finding them. There's no damn way in hell you got 70-something thousand black women missing. And we this damn quiet. If you want the elo eloquent speeches, I'm out of that shit. I've been out of that for a while. I'm, a, I'm talking, I'm going to say it, and I'm going to speak exactly how I'm, what's on my mind and how I feel. I'll save that for the lectures in the professional environments. Right now, what we need to do is we need to man the fuck up. I'm just really, truly, actually appalled at the fact that it's okay. And, and, and don't say it's not okay. We ain't doing shit. Something my great-grandfather, my dad, because he adopted me, taught me, is I'm not looking at what you're saying, son. I'm looking at what you're doing. You want to show me what you feel about something? Let me see it in your actions. That's why you see the work behind me, the body of work behind me that you see. Because I didn't just sit up and talk about it. I wasn't just sitting up spewing something. I didn't give a damn about no debating. I didn't give a damn about no in intellectual pissing contest. I done got pulled. Try, it's a bunch of people trying to pull me in that. I done got it. I, I'm not about that. I'm about solutions. You want to solve something, let's sit down. Hell, I even let you put your name on it. If, even if I created it. Because that's I'm not here for all that shit. I'm here to protect my people. I'm here to win. I'm here to make a difference. And at the end of the day, my legacy will speak for itself. That's all that matters to me is I'm building a legacy. So the question is, what does matter to us? Because right now our actions don't say that our women matter. They, they don't say that our men and boys matter either because they get molly wop too. But this, I'll, I'll deal with that on another one. They set our boys up for prison starting at five years old. I done told you about that. I wrote about it in two different books. And what we do, we keep sending them up there, letting them do it. But you know why? We don't understand how things work. And when the people like myself come and try to tell you, we devalue them, we dismiss them, 
we question them more than we question them sorry ass politicians in Washington and we trust those motherfuckers to do what they haven't done yet we've increased our voter turnout since the early 1960s every presidential cycle except one that was the Trump election we've increased it every time and we vote 90 plus percent Democrat and we're still losing ground they still gassing the hell out of us and still losing ground if we actually do our research we find out that those motherfuckers has done it probably done us worse than the ones that keep saying are the racist most racist while Republicans are more overt Democrats are definitely more sneaky and diabolical you just gotta determine which one of them fucking wings you want to deal with or you can decide I'm gonna create my own power force why do you think the black nationalist party and the black panther party was such a threat they represented black autonomy uh, the development and the growth of a non-need a non-need of what a non-need of political support or uh, political provision we were figuring out how to be us and take care of ourselves and if you ever notice that anytime we've done that in this country there's been efforts to destroy us and because we didn't understand how things work it was easy what happened with uh, the early 20 the, the late 1800s and the early 20s with towns like Slocum Texas Wilmington, Delaware, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Black Wall Street, Ro uh, Rosewood, uh, Florida, uh, and, and, and uh, others, is we understood economic science, but we didn't understand mi military science or political science. So we didn't understand the need for allyship. We didn't understand the need for having systems of protection to defend what we were building. And so we were growing these economic enclaves um, but they were easily destroyed because we weren't prepared to defend them and we didn't have the outside allyship we didn't spend or invest any of that money in creating political protection that says because this is a financial source for XYZ you guys don't have the right to go in there and destroy it those are things that we have to learn we have to learn that when you are not the strongest force in there uh, in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the vicinity, then you've got to have connections with the people who are. And those allies have to be made. It's just that simple. Anytime that someone can just come in and sweep something up, sweep something completely off the map and nothing be done, then there were some things that were missed. So that's that. But one of the things that we really need to do is we really need to really search ourselves and ask ourselves why we are so disconnected from from ourselves uh we'll see something to get upset about it but we won't act on it they don't have to agree with something you go after one of those white people about something and they feel like that white person is being uh victimized by the black community and see what happens look what happened to darren wilson he shot that dude that dude's hands up in the air 20 some feet away unarmed and he shot him what seven eight nine times talking about mike brown that story got out and it, it hands up don't shoot was a theme you think that stopped those white folks from giving him more than five hundred thousand dollars for a defense he never had to ha had to uh uh, wage and that, that 500,000 is only what we know because eventually after they had raised the five 500,000 GoFundMe shut down that and so they, they set up some other ways through banks and some other stuff so I don't know how much he ended up with there are a bunch of rumors I couldn't verify but a lot more and that's how they move and watch any other community, that's how they move. I'm going to give you a prime example. And this isn't me attacking the Jewish community. It's actually me marveling at it. I sit down when I unwind during the day. I, I fix my meal. Um, 
normally I don't do I don't eat at fast food so everything I eat I either fix or I stop and I pick up something like a salad or a sandwich but anyway I fix it and I sit down and and I'm like and there's a channel I watch and that channel there's a consistent commercial of this young woman who comes out of her house her neighbor's working on his car white guy can't tell which you know ethnicity but definitely white um, she's obviously Jewish but in a, you'll know why but she comes out and her daughter goes mommy what's that and she says that's nothing just get in the car and he goes and looks over at it and it's a swastika and it's a Jewish slur it's an anti-semitic slur and she leaves when she comes back the garage is painted over and she looks over and her neighbor's shoes he's still working on his car definitely a commercial Still working on his car and with the same damn wrench doing the same thing. But anyway, uh, she looks at his feet and there's paint that matches the paint on the garage on his foot. And she just says, thank you. And then on the thing, it right and it says, uh, one in so many Jews are targeted for violence, you know, everything. And what they what you have to understand is that's paid for by the Jewish community. And it's more than just an awareness campaign. It is a politically powerful campaign. It is a positioning campaign. And yes, they have the funds to do that, but we waste billions. We spend $2 billion a year on Jordans. Between October 30th, uh, the last week, this is say the last week in October, preparing and leading up to uh, Halloween to uh, December 24th, Christmas Eve, we spent $570 billion on the commercialization of holidays, just on those three holidays, Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas, something along the lines of 40-something billion on Halloween, blacks, 40-something billion on Halloween, 50-something billion on uh, Thanksgiving and 453 billion during Christmas. What if we invested that in strengthening our political position? What if we invested that in creating resources for our people to strengthen their skill sets and their earning capacity? What if we used that for educational programs that taught us how to amass and protect our wealth and through that built and did what they did? They're smaller in population than we are. Same thing as the Asian. Asians have the highest earning capacity in the U.S. They earn on an, in, in the median earning more than whites. And they're rapidly closing the gap. Last I saw they were approaching 100,000 in median household wealth. Um, whites at 184 and they control the power. Blacks at 14,000. And that gap is widening and our numbers going down because we are not prepared. And so we are pretending we we out buy them. That's the crazy thing. We literally buy twice as many as Mercedes as they do. And they have what? More than 10 times the money than we do. On average. And we don't see the problem in that it's not a matter of not having money it's our relationship with money it's how we see things it's this need to feel and since we can't have the success we want the symbols the symbolic idea or the symbolic representation of success is what we have anchored ourselves in we're going to look the part if we're not the part and that's a place for that if you're building something and you need to be in certain spaces feeling the part will give you uh, the cur the courage and the confidence to step out and move into areas you may not uh feel you belong uh there's a place for that but to constantly do it with that being the end game the, the Merce if the mercedes is the end game you've lost now, if the Mercedes is the game that's going to get you to a point to where you can build your company, acquire clients, and do that, and that's a part of it, then that, that that's a strategy. And it's not the end game. If the end game is what people think about what you have, you've already been defeated. 
So it's not so much what's done, it's the strategy and the thought processes behind it. And we can talk about it and we can go on and on and on, but we have a problem with the number of black women that are missing and our lack of attention to the issue. So I'm challenging everybody who watches this to become a difference maker, to become involved and engaged. That's my challenge. On that note, look, I'm out of here. You guys have an unbelievable remainder of your day. And I'm going to actually do a few more things before I shut down for the day. On that note, I'm out of here. Yeah, yeah. They said I should give it up like that just ain't good. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. I'm free to be whoever I want to be.